But I will be introducing our uh, speaker for tonight, um, Chris Ann uh, Bayoncourt Murphy. And for me, it's been a, an absolute blessing to get to know Chris Ann over approximately just about three years now. Um, we have worked together uh, on an evangelical advocacy project that has now become a book on transformational advocacy. And Chris Ann's leadership and wisdom has been inspiring and has been wonderful uh, to, to observe. We share actually quite a bit of a background in uh, Latin America, and even though I hadn't met Chris Ann before, I was very familiar with many of the groups with which she had worked. And what I want to do is just spend a little bit of time introducing you to Chris Ann. I know many of you uh, know her and know a decent amount about her, but I think there are some things in here that, uh, that you may not know as far as the richness of the background. Chris Ann uh, graduated uh, undergrad with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from the University of Connecticut. Uh, and then went right to work assisting in grassroots organizing with Mexican migrant farm workers, especially around the issues of pesticides, worker safety, and wage laws in Oregon. Spent uh, about a year doing that. She then joined for three years the Latin America Working Group, which is one of two preeminent uh, advocacy groups working on Latin America in Washington, D.C., and was responsible for issues such as corporate responsibility campaigns, School of the Americas for uh, human rights issues, especially in uh, as related to work on Cuba, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. She then also uh, did some research work for the Religious Task Force on Central America and Mexico, another very key organization uh, in the 1990s uh, that was working on these issues, especially around immigration and labor issues on the U.S.-Mexico border. She spent a summer with the Office of Urban Affairs of the Archdiocese of Hartford and assisted on conference planning to launch an education campaign uh, around Connecticut's urban sprawl. And she also represented uh, that office on an interfaith coalition with representatives from very different, uh, from various different uh, faiths. She completed then her master's um, in theological studies at the Western Jesuit School of Theology. Uh, but as uh, she had done in, in previous places at the University of Connecticut, she had been an RA, she also took lead uh, among the student body there and was chair of Weston Social Justice Forum and led two delegations uh, to El Salvador for the 10th anniversary of the martyrdom of the Jesuits who were killed by the El Salvador regime in 1999 and 2000. She then joined Bread for the World for three years, uh, again uh, with the local community organizing as a local church outreach associate in Texas, organizing Texas churches, uh, um, universities, activists, especially around international poverty and hunger campaigns, which obviously is the, the, the focus of Bread for the World, and engaging in lobbying uh, in D.C. with briefings. She also created worship and popular education materials. She wrote grants and reported on them, fundraised with major donors, and co-chaired the Racial and Ethnic Task Force. She then took over uh, the executive director of position for Witness for Peace. Any of you all who were working in Central America, especially and in Latin America as a whole, uh, would know of them and their absolutely amazing work. Uh, directed that organization, its budget of over one million, uh, with its programs centering Colombia, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Mexico, as well as five regional semi-autonomous satellites in the United States. She, for just about a year, served as the interim national coordinator for the MICA Challenge. Some of you may have heard of that. Uh, doing a lot of fundraising to get them going for a startup project, organizing a national strategy for them, especially looking at impoverished and marginalized, marginalized communities uh, in other parts of the world, and to hold our government accountable to the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, she also led planning in the Global Leaders Forum, where Ban Ki-moon gave a keynote address well, this was actually probably before Ken Ban Ki Moon, right? Um, gave an address to, no, actually 2008, to 350 evangelical religious leaders uh, gathering to focus on the MDG. And lastly, she has served since 2008 as Red for the World's National Evangelical Relations uh, person. Um, and as part of that, uh, has done all kinds of different things. I won't go into details on them, but uh, as part of that was where I had the opportunity to meet Chris meet Chris Ann and work with her around that evangelical advocacy project. She is just coming off a stint as the interim director of church relations and along all of this uh, work that she's done, she has also been trained uh, by the Industrial Areas Foundation in community-based uh, organizing models and trained in trauma recovery program from Eastern Mennonite University. Now, 
As impressive as all that may be, um, there are other things that really have stood out for me as far as Brazilian is concerned. Uh, things that I think are actually more important. The first has been her commitment to her faith. And I think all of you who have had uh, Chrisanne in class uh, sh I can see that and the way it just shines through in her humility, in the way that she listens, in the joy that she radiates, and the way that she speaks and talks about our Savior. The second is her commitment to her family, to her husband Jay and to their three young children, and the way that she always makes sure that she makes time for them. And the third is her absolute delight in learning from you and sharing with you and in challenging you to follow God's call with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. The joy that she has in her relationships with you all is palpable. So I can think of nobody more appropriate to be up here to give you your commissioning address. So will you please join me in welcoming Chris Ann as she shares what the Spirit has placed on her heart for you. David Brock was a generous man. <laughs> it's so good to be here. And it's such an honor to be asked to share a few reflections. And a really special day. So thank you. This is a this is a pretty unique ceremony. It's a commissioning ceremony. <laughs> not a graduation, even though I'm looking at a whole bunch of people that are in <laughs> But that aside, um, it's, it's unique in the sense that uh, we're being sent out, but not everything is finished yet. Mm -hmm. okay. There's still work to be done. We're called by name for a piece of work. We're called to be co-laborers with God. How similar this commissioning is to the mystery we as Christians find ourselves in, in regards to the kingdom of God. It's already, but not yet. Our God is a glorious, almighty God, but our God's a mysterious God indeed. In this final stretch here, at this time of commissioning, some of you are anxiously awaiting graduation in order to return to an organization, a church, a ministry, that you know and that you love. Others of you, your world has been turned upside down. Between the time you started the program and now, things are very different. So the future may be unclear. It may be uncharted territory. And yet for some of you, life after Eastern will be a new chapter altogether. So you are on the cusp of making a new change. To that end, I hope that your journey over the next few months, over this final stretch, be graced by God, that it be a renewing time filled with fresh energy and hope. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you finish well. It has been an absolute joy to come alongside you as adjunct faculty here. Last year I began teaching the Advocacy, Human Rights, and Public Policy course here at Easter. And as God would have it, as David shared, I found myself in Baltimore at an Accord Summit several years ago with a former Bread for the World colleague who was at the conference and who was involved in Easter. Melissa Yao had invited me to dinner with a group of her her friends, her cohort from Eastern, and that's where I met David Frockema. That introduction led to a collaborative project between Bread for the World and Eastern, like David said, called evangelicaladvocacy.org. And that invitation to teach came, and as he said, now a book, talking about something we care so very deeply about, transformational advocacy. God is mysterious. But God has a plan. God calls us by name. I want you to know that Eastern's been really important to me for my own development. In the course of my work with evangelicals at Bread for the World, I have been absolutely amazed and inspired 
by the, the special ministry happening at Christian colleges and universities, like Eastern. How critical colleges are in the work of creating and equipping disciples to be builders of society, pursuers of justice, and ambassadors for hope and redemption in God's world. Eastern is a pioneer in this special ministry. Those of you in the MA for International Development and the MBA in Economic Development, you know this. Eastern's different than many schools in how it values faith, its practice, and the perspective of practitioners so that students may be really ready and equipped to engage the world. At the core of my being, I believe that advocacy is integral to our Christian mission and ministry, to our work in the area of justice. What is de desperately needed is that Christian development workers, like you, ambassadors for Christ, I am talking to you, brothers and sisters, it is critical that you're equipped with the tools to recognize your own agency, to find your own voice to engage in justice, to restore hurting people and places in disrepair for God's purpose, and that you are ready to empower others, to take leadership to empower others in your communities and your ministries. Eastern is a wonderful place for equipping disciples. And I'm honored to be a small part of that. What I want you to know about me is really when my life of justice started. I'm from Central Connecticut. About 20 years ago, I graduated from UConn, as David said, a major in anthropology. I'm a working class kid. My family wasn't poor. We owned our own house. My parents were believers. I'm the first in my family to graduate college. My mom was a teacher's aide. My dad was a twin maker. And I wanted to do something meaningful after I graduated. So I joined a Christian domestic service volunteer uh, agency, and I landed in Woodburn, Oregon working with Mexican migrant farm workers. This experience was radicalizing, absolutely convicting for me. It was my first experience of living with people who were really on the margins of society. They were vulnerable in so many ways. It was an experience of living with people who live in the shadows. And I began establishing relationships with people who risked everything to cross the border to feed their families. I was brought face to face with injustice. I could absorb all of our time tonight telling you about the hardships I saw, the worker rights abuses they suffered at working in the Willamette Valley picking strawberries, how they risked their lives to cross the border seeking a better life, oftentimes becoming indebted to coyotes who would take them through the desert, how they would often end up as modern-day indentured ser servants living in migrant labor camps without heat or running water. But that is for another day. What I want to tell you about was about how I was convicted. I was convicted first because I learned I needed to do something about that. I was overwhelmed by the scope of the problem, but after much soul searching, soul searching and wrestling with the context I was in, and many tears, what was crystal clear to me was that change needed to be addressed at a systemic level. What I also want to tell you about is the second part of that conviction. I began to understand scripture in an entirely different way. Passages about poverty and poor people and vulnerability, passages about injustice, that was broken open for me. I began to understand that God, God's story was related to my story and my call. God had a plan for me and called me by name. 
That whole situation, that whole experience led me to work in DC in the policy advocacy arena where I've been since. I tell you all this story because I think it's related to this sending ceremony today. We are all part of God's story. We are the characters in God's story. And there's work to be done. In this time of already and not yet, in this time of sending, I encourage you to reflect on an amazing biblical figure named Nehemiah. He's a wonderful example of an advocate in scripture. He was sent to do the, build, the building of the wall, the business of restoring and reforming society for God's purpose. You remember the Nehemiah story. It was 5th century BC. Nehemiah was a Jew working for the king of Persia. Many of his relatives went back to, to, to Jerusalem but the city was in terrible ruin. He gets a visit from his relatives and inquires with them about how the city's doing and how his people are, and he gets terrible news. The walls are wreckage, the gates have been destroyed by fire, the people are displaced. So what does this amazing biblical figure of Nehemiah have to do with us, with our story? What can we learn from this? Nehemiah allowed himself to be moved. He allowed himself to be affected. And he was shaken. God put a deep desire in his heart. He allowed the suffering of his people to penetrate him. He was ruined. He was overwhelmed. He was convicted. And he prayed. He fasted and he prayed. He mourned and he grieved for what he heard. He let himself sit with that pain, the pain of destruction. And out of that, God gave him a vision to rebuild. Nehemiah took inventory of his resources, his power. There's an amazing part of the story. It's the end of the first chapter. After all this crying and all this mourning, and just he's he's so absolutely you know struck by all, all that he's heard. He says, Now I was the cupbearer to the king. It's like this is his epiphany. He realizes, but I have some resources. There's something I can do. Nehemiah worked out his message and he made his ask. He was as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. He picked a strategic moment in the presence of, presence of the king to ask, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, send me to Judah, Judah so that I may rebuild. And the king sends him. Nehemiah was not afraid to get messy. So he went. He assumed leadership. He began the hard work of rebuilding. And he wasn't alone. He had many others with him. He empowered his team toward the task of rebuilding the wall. Nehemiah is a wonderful example of a holy advocate. God was calling his people to participate in his work in the world. Much of our work in many of our ministries will require some sort of advocacy. Solving big problems today, addressing root causes, unjust systems present in our time, those have policy implications. Take home from the United States, for example. It's a big problem. 49 million Americans struggle to put food on the table. 16 million of them are children. Not, there's not a scarcity of food, but there's a prevalence of poverty. It's a big problem. Globally, 842 million people suffer from chronic hunger worldwide. And back to my original story about working with migrant farm workers, the immigration system is broken, by the way. These are very real stories at the forefront of the political wranglings in Washington. 
But I'm here to tell you, evangelicals have had a massive voice in the movement for comprehensive immigration reform. Over the last decade, the evangelical community has done the messy, hard work of overcoming differences within its own ranks and has produced some extraordinary unity throughout the evangelical immigration table, seeking to reform the immigration system. Because I work in DC, I can tell you that Washington needs to hear from you. They need to hear your faithful concerns. When you speak from your faith about the things that move you, about what you see in the world that breaks God's heart, that transcends the political divide, the polarizing rancor. Frankly, I think it's the only thing that does. And you can help members of Congress champion those issues that in a lot of times their hearts they really want to do. So back to the mystery, back to our call, back to being ruined and convicted, there is work to be done. And if I can leave you with one word, for the students, I know since I've had all of you in class, I know you've heard this. And hopefully you'll bear with me and listen to it again. For those of you in the room, I hope that you'll appreciate it. I'm reading from the Holy Long from Ronald Mulheiser, the Lord's Prayer. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because for the road ahead, I encourage you to keep your, your eyes on God and your, your prayer life centered. Um, and in your praying of the Lord's Prayer, if you remember this, this is the Lord's Prayer for Justice. Our Father, who always stands with the weak, the powerless, the poor, the abandoned, the sick, the aged, the very young, the unborn, and those who by victim of circumstance bear the heat of the day, who art in heaven, where everything will be reversed, where the first will be last and the last will be first, but where all will be well and every manner of being will be well. Hallowed be thy name. May we always acknowledge your holiness, respecting your ways. They're not our ways. Your standards are not our standards. By the reverence we give your name, Pull us out of the selfishness that present, prevents us from seeing the pain of our neighbor. Your kingdom come. Help us to create a world where beyond our own needs and hurts, we will do justice, love tenderly, and walk humbly with you and each other. <coughs> Your will be done. Open our freedom to let you in so that the complete mutuality that characterizes your life might throw, flow through our veins, and thus the life that we help generate may radiate your equal love for all and your special love for the poor. On earth as it is in heaven, may the work of our hands, the temples and structures that we build in this world, reflect the temple and structure of your glory, so that the joy, graciousness, tenderness, and justice of heaven will show forth within all of the structures of the earth. Give life and love to us, and help us to see that always everything is a gift. Help us to know that nothing comes to us by right, and that we must give because we have been given to. Help us realize we must give to the poor, not because they need it, not because of our own health depending on it, us, the truly plural us. Give not just to our own, but to everyone, including those who are very different than the narrow us. Give your gifts to us all equally. This day, not tomorrow. Do not let us push things off into some indefinite future so that we can come to live justified lives in the face of injustice because we can make good excuses for our inactivity. Our daily bread, so 
so that each person in the world may have enough food, enough clean water, enough clean air, adequate health care, and sufficient access to education so as to have the sustenance for a healthy life. Teach us to give from our sustenance and not from our surplus. And forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our blindness toward our neighbor, our self-preoccupation, our racism, our sexism, and our incurable propensity to worry about ourselves and our own. Forgive us our capacity to watch the evening news and to do nothing about it. And forgive us those who trespass against us. Help us to forgive those who victimize us. Help us to mellow out in spirit, to not, go, to not grow bitter with age, to forgive the imperfect parents and systems that wounded, cursed, and ignored us. And do not put us to the test. Do not judge us only by whether we have fed the hungry, given clothing to the naked, visited the sick, or tried to mend the systems that victimize the poor. Spare us the test, for none of us can stand before your gospel scrutiny. Give us instead more days to mend our ways, our selfishness, and our systems. But deliver us from evil. That is from the blindness that lets us continue to participate in anonymous systems within which we need not see who gets less as we get more.